God is good and the Lord leads us. I've been so edified in this service of worship by the songs that we've been singing, by uh, Eric praying for us, and by those testimonies of the, I especially appreciate the way those young men summarized what David Papillon preached on up at Fort Wilderness, and I, I, I heard echoes of each of the songs that we sang in what they shared, and I know, because I knew where we were headed this morning, that it's the same theme that we're going to be in in 1 Peter. God is so good to lead us. Uh, with his mighty right hand. As we prepare to open God's word in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 14, let's bow in prayer. Living God, prepare our hearts now in this moment to hear your word. More than that, prepare our hearts now in this moment to love your word. Your word is our law of love. May we be ruled by it. Your word is a physician lovingly healing us. May we be healed by it. Lord of love, give us this gift. Open our hearts to learn and to love your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. Amen. You need to change. The Bible verse that we're going to look at this morning is written to you because the fact of the matter is you need to change. You have been changed. If you're a born-again believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, this Bible verse that we're going to look at this morning shows you that you have been changed. And that's a glorious truth. You can change. If you've been born again, and if you receive and believe the truths that we're going to see this morning in 1 Peter chapter 1, you can change. This passage is about the powerful truth that you can change. You can change from what you are or were in yourself without God's mighty power into what you can begin to be by the Spirit of God working in you to change you from the inside out. 1 Peter 1, verse 14, and in the cluster of its context, 1 Peter 1, 13 through 16, is predicated on these fundamental truths. You need to change, and you have been changed, and you can change today. I see four steps in the way God brings the change of holiness into our mixed up unholy lives. Some novels you read or maybe a movie that you watch, it jumps back and forth in time. Maybe at the beginning, the characters are old and then it jumps back to when they were little and then you see what happened in the middle of their lives and then back to old and back to young. I'm gonna jump around in the order of verses 13, 14, 15, and 16, but the reason I'm jumping around in the order is because these four steps, I, would, I present them to you as this is the order in which God works this change in our lives. First, God calls us. Second, we become children of God. Third, We see reality and our desires begin to change. And fourth, we obey. A little or a lot bit more than we did before. Our text is 1 Peter 1, verse 14, but it draws its meaning in this context of 13 through 16. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. Let's just skip over these four points really briefly, and then we'll dig into each one to get the meat of it. So first point, God calls us. You see that in verse 15. It uses the significant and heavy biblical word, call. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. This calling is the calling to conversion. This calling is that the the best news in the world 
the somewhat mysterious statement where Jesus said, all whom the Father has given me will come to me. For by my spirit, I will effectually call them into salvation. God calls us when he draws us into eternal life. It's the same thing that Peter calls being born again in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. The call of God is the call saying live. The call saying believe. The call affects God's life-giving work in our lives. Second, we become children of God. And you see how we get this from verse 14. As obedient children... No longer be conformed, but be transformed. We become children of God. So the effect of regeneration is the effect of the new birth. New birth is now we're a new child. We're a child of God. We have a heavenly father. We're adopted into a new family. God calls us. We become children of God. Third, we see reality and our desires begin to change. You see that in verse 13, that your mind changes, your hope changes, And then as obedient children, ignorance and former passions no longer direct you, but you see reality differently and your desires begin to change. Being called and made into children of God makes us no longer ignorant orphans who just wallow around doing whatever we can to get ourselves satisfied. No, now we belong to a father and he loves us and we love him and we see all of reality differently. And then fourth, we obey more than we did before. Instead of unholiness, now as the Father who called us is holy, verse 15, we are holy in our conduct. You see, he starts with the mind, set your mind, but he gets to the conduct. Now, the the important thing is the battle in the mind, but the important thing is the living of the life. We actually obey more than we did before. This fourth step, we obey more than we did before, is the culmination and the inevitable result of the first three. So if that's our four points together, let's uh, slow down and appreciate each one and draw what Peter means for us to know so that we can change and we can rejoice that we have been changed because we all know you need to change. So the first point is God calls us. You see, it's the word call in verse 15 It's verse 18, ransomed by the blood. Verse 21 says, through whom you are believers in God. Kind of going backwards in verse 10, it's the grace that's revealed to us. Going backwards more in verse 4, it's the inheritance that's been given to us. And it all hinges on that marvelous work of regeneration from verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he's caused us to be born again. The call of God is the call into being born again. The call of God is the call into that inheritance that was purchased by Christ's blood. And this calling of God, this calling that is from God is why the first word of verse 13 is therefore. We covered verse 13 last week. uh, And everything that follows, follows from that therefore in verse 13. In other words, everything you are now called to do is possible because God effectually and powerfully called you. Don't mix up the order. God's not sort of like, I wish you would do better. Can't you try harder? God effectually calls those whom he saves into sanctification. It all follows from the therefore. Every change we are exhorted to make, we are empowered to make by the Spirit of God. That's how the therefore works. Every change we're exhorted to make, we are empowered to make because God changes us from the inside out. We say using the grammatical language, every imperative is the result of the indicative. Or we say all of our doing 
happens because of the divine done. Every obligation we have toward God is possible to fulfill, and you do have obligations toward God that I'm calling you to fulfill, that Peter's calling you to fulfill. But every obligation you have toward God that's yours to fulfill is only possible because of the lavish blessings that God was not obliged to give to you, but that he gave you out of his free, sovereign, magnificent grace. Which is to say that all of your good works will happen because Christ completed his work for you. If Christ hadn't said, it is finished, you wouldn't be able to begin the job. But because Christ declared, it is finished, I have fulfilled the work that the Father gave me to do. Now all of those who are his will begin to do the good works that flow from that. Peter bases the transformational power of the Christian life in the past, in what Jesus did, He was baptized in our place in the Jordan. He lived a perfect life in our place. He was crucified at the place of the skull, and he rose again. Peter bases the transformational power that that, that makes you change in the past. But see in our text, Peter also bases the transformational power that makes you change in the future. Look at verse 13. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope, that's future-oriented, fully on the grace that, future tense, will be, shall be brought to you at the revelation of Christ Jesus. You see it? Not only is it based in the, fu- in the past, it's based in the future. Hope in the glory that will be ours when Christ returns, as he promised that he would. This is a repetition from the seventh verse. Look at verse seven. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found a result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All the light and blessedness, all the glory, all all the, the, the glory of transformation that will be ours when we behold Jesus face to face. We shall be glorious because he is glorious and he will share his glory with us face to face. We'll be changed to be like him. In the testimonies from Fort, a couple of the young men talked about guilt and shame over their sin. The the ways that you were conformed to the world yesterday the ways that you failed and feel bad about today from last night, things of which you are ashamed. Well, this text says that because Christ has done what he did for you and because Christ will fulfill what he has promised to fulfill for you, you can change and you can be changed. Your cravings, your passions, your appetites, today is the day for that change. How how does that change happen? Verse 13 says it happens by fully fixing our hope on what's coming in the future. Instead of living for people's approval and compromising and going squishy and weak on the truth of God's word because you want people to like you, if you focus on Jesus' return and what will be ours with him, you can change. Your motivations and your behaviors and your speech can all change. Because Christ is risen for me in the past and Christ is coming for me in the future. All of this because God calls us and God keeps all of his promises. That's first, the calling that God who calls us will complete all that he's promised. Second, we become children of God. Verse 14, as obedient children. This is crucial because this shows that we really do become something new. Namely, the Spirit of God causes new birth. And now where there was death, there is now life. Where there was alienation, now there is belonging. Where there was orphanhood, now there is sonship. You see, something really does change when the Spirit of God really comes in. Romans 8 says, uh, this is ironic. Romans 8 says something that is critically important and that is almost always ignored. And church, I want to emphasize it to you because you should no longer ignore this. Romans 8 says 
that those who are believers have received the Spirit of God. And then Romans 8 says, those who are in the flesh who do not have the Spirit of God cannot please God. Cannot please God. What a thing to say. But see what it says on the front end is that those who have received the Spirit of God, now they can change, they have been changed, and they will continue to be changed. That's the whole flow of the argument in those first two paragraphs of Romans chapter 8. It, it, it doesn't mean, when I say that if you don't have the Spirit of God, you cannot please God, that doesn't mean that an unregenerate unbeliever can't kick a bad habit. They can. But an unregenerate unbeliever can't choose holiness in conformity to God as the result of loving God because they know God's great love for them. These are two completely different things. When Romans 8 says those who don't have the Spirit cannot change in these ways, and it says that those who do have the Spirit can change in these ways, this is what it's getting at. The, the fact of what, the, what blessing is yours when you become a child of God. When the Bible uses this illustration of being a child of God, don't overcomplicate it and make it uh, something that it isn't. We all, we all understand what it means to be the child of a papa. We all understand that. Children inherit the nature of their parents. We look at a picture of our youngest grandson, Clive, and he looks exactly like my son-in-law, Andrew, looked at that age. Like, exactly we look at a picture of our granddaughter, and then we looked at a picture of my Amy when, when she was four years old, and the similarity is striking. Children inherit the nature of their parents. Don't overcomplicate that. What Peter says is, God called you. You're his child and church. There are a lot of things I don't know, but I know this. God is holy. God is holy. Therefore, therefore, be holy like the Father who called you, like the Father who adopted you. If you realize th that, that what it means to be a child of God, Peter goes so far as to say in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, you look at 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, 2 Peter 1, 3, and 4, God's divine powers granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us, there it is, to his own glory and excellence. And look what he says, by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in the world because of sinful desire. When we're children of God, we're partakers of the divine nature. This is a marvelous gift that was given to us. And this is why we need to change and we can change. If you would realize the value of your status as God's child, what a privilege you've been given. That, the, that you were redeemed, not with perishable things like silver and gold, but by the precious blood of the Lamb of God. Then I, I believe you'd live in a new way. You'd think in a new way. You'd value in a new way when you become a child of God. That's why verse 14 says, as obedient children, conform yourselves to your father. We've been born again and begotten by God. As obedient children, we are expected to honor our father. We don't expect obedience from strangers who aren't a part of the family, but we expect obedience, or we should expect obedience, from children who belong to the family little true story from my own life. When our kids were still little and st we were still raising them in the home, uh, I, Amy and I both were committed to raising our kids right and disciplining them when they disobeyed. And when our kids would have friends over, I would I wouldn't discipline my friends' kids the same way, the same exact way I discipline my kids, you know what I mean? But when my kids had friends over, I would expect their friends to behave 
the way that I expect my children to behave. And if, if our kids' friends were out of line, I would correct, rebuke, exhort, admonish my kids' friends. And more than once, more than twice or three times, after that would happen, I get a call or someone would knock on the door a couple days later and say, hey, when my little guy was here playing with your son, you corrected him and I appreciate that. Could you show me how to do that? How exactly did you do that? But also, more than once or twice, after I corrected my kids' friends, I got a phone call or a knock on the door. How dare you? You, When my kids are at your house, you do not have the right to tell them what to do. Well, okay, bye. (laughs) Like, I don't know what else to do. I'm not saying I always corrected them correctly, but is it just to say that even in some of those situations, we're like, you know, when someone's part of the family, we bring in discipline this way. When they're not, we bring it in this way. If you are a child of God, holiness and obedience is expected. Doesn't Hebrews 12 say that if you're a child of God and you're disobedient, because God loves you, your disobedience will merit discipline. It's expected because you're a child of God. But it's an expectation of honor and of love. So we're called, we become children of God. Third, we see reality and our desires change. You need to change. You have been changed. You can change. The first word in each of those three sentences is you. And here in this third portion, I I do want to talk about you. Why do you do the things that you do? Even when you want to change, why do you have such a hard time sustaining the changes that you want to sustain? How can we understand ourselves? Follow right here and uh, think not just of physical anatomy, but think of the anatomy of the soul of a human being. And just trace with me, I love doing this, just trace with me, everything that we could put if we were, if we were making a, a, a word cloud or a diagram of the anatomy of a human being's soul and behavior, what would it be? Just look at our text itself, verse 13, the mind, that's a part of us. Verse 13, our actions, Verse 13, our hope, our hope is a key part of the human anatomy of the soul. Verse 14, obedience. Verse 14, passions. That's part of your soul. Verse 14, ignorance or knowledge. It's former ignorance, so it's ignorance that could be replaced by knowledge. That's a part of your soul. That's a part of your heart. That's a part of your mind. Going on, verse 15, your conduct, your behavior, your choices. This passion pulsates between the passions and the lusts that drive us in one direction formerly and the new hope, the new grace, and the new mind that empower us to go in a new direction. This pulsation between the passions and the conduct. Think about it. Passions and conduct. You desire what you desire, therefore you do what you do. But this text also pulsates between thinking and behaving. So you do what you do because you think what you think. Both of those things are true. You do what you do because you want what you want, but you also do what you do because you think what you think. Thinking guides deciding. Desiring guides deciding and thinking guides deciding and focusing on hope and motivation influences the decisions that you make. Can I just show you a little bit of good news in verse 14? As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Hello, church. Every single one of you, your ignorance can be former. It can be former. Your alienation can be former. Your orphanhood can be former. 
your shame and your guilt can be former. It can all change. It can all change by the blood of Jesus, by the ascension of Jesus to the right hand of the Father, from which place he poured out upon us the Holy Spirit because he knows that those who have not the Spirit cannot please God, but those who have the Spirit please him as his beloved children. It can all change. So what changes Again, look at how, how carefully or just how vibrantly he paints the anatomy of the choices, the desires, the passions, the conduct, the behavior. When God calls you, your nature changes and your hope changes and your mind changes and then your passions and your behaviors change. In this text, fix your hope is the primary verb. We looked at that uh, last week. Fix your hope is the primary verb. And then it's modified by two adverbial clauses that are both mental. Fix your hope by what? By preparing your mind for action and by being sober-minded. Fixing your hope is the main verb. And then the two main means are mental. Passages like this are one reason among many that I rejoice in the sufficiency of Scripture for all of life and for all of counseling. It's one reason among many that I reject a a humanistic, psychological attempts to understand what motivates the human heart and what renovates the human mind. God's inerrant and authoritative word shows us who we are and why we do what we do and how we can change. And it does so beautifully and gloriously in a way that honors the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love how realistic verse 14 is. As obedient children, look what he says. This, it, it, basically, it sounds like this. Kids, I want you to obey. I know sometimes you ain't gonna obey, but I know you're still my obedient kids, is basically what he says. As obedient children, you're gonna obey. No longer do those sketchy things that you sometimes do, is what he's saying. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. It's so realistic. Those desires are still there. But in a way, they are former. That still something you desire, but that ain't you. This is the whole, this is Romans 7, Romans 8. This is the the whole process, right? Now that I'm a Christian, this is how realistic it is. So, so Peter, are you saying, now that I'm a Christian, I will have no desire to sin? Peter says, no, I ain't saying that. Peter, are you saying that now that I'm a Christian, in some way, my desires will be changed? Yes, absolutely, that's what I'm saying. Peter, are you saying that now that I'm a Christian, I will successfully resist sin every time? No, that's not what I'm saying. But Peter, are you saying that now that I'm a Christian, I will actually successfully resist the passions of sin? Yes, that is what I'm saying. Not every time, but increasingly. Now that I'm a Christian, I have new knowledge and new power to say no to sin. The passions still smolder, but the fire is not what it was because the blood of Jesus put it out. So to summarize those four points, this is, this is how God works in our lives. You need to change, you have been changed, and you can change. But let me hasten to say, you can change is a long way from the Christian gospel. It's not the Christian gospel. The Christian gospel is you can change because Jesus Christ took your place, because Jesus Christ now lives in you by his resurrection power and he's changing you from the inside out. With this whole gospel understanding, let me conclude by giving you seven quick strategies for change. Seven quick strategies for change. Number one, Take in. And by this, I simply mean meditate on Scripture, memorize Scripture, read Scripture, learn Scripture. Take in the 
Bible. Take in the Bible. This is, this is the, 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 the first thing that I got to say about how a, a, a strategy to actually change. Because the question is, how can any man or woman keep his or her way pure? How can any man or woman keep his or her way pure? And the answer is, by keeping it according to thy word. How can I keep my way according to thy word? That's the question. How can I keep my way according to God's word? The answer is, God, your word have I hidden in my heart so I might not sin against you, but so that I might keep your word. This is the way. Take in scripture, memorize it, meditate on it. This is, this is following the way of the Lord Jesus Christ, who in the wilderness, facing the temptation of the onslaught of the roaring lion himself, countered with what three words? It is written. When uh, David and Serena were here, uh, when David was the speaker for four, we spent a little time with them and we were talking with David and Serena, Serena's mom and dad, Timothy and Nancy, they're old friends of ours. They used to attend here. And we were talking to Serena about her mother's scripture memory program. And Amy and I both left that conversation like, wow, she, 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 that woman has memorized so much scripture it, it, and it's so healthy and it's so good and it made us aspire to want to do more than we have. Number one, take in. Number two, keep out. Number two, keep out. By that, what do I mean? I mean, cut out the inputs that make you worldly. I mean, stop pouring grease on the slide. That's what I mean. Whatever makes your slide into sin easier, shut that spigot off. Fast from that which distracts you or de-elevates your gaze. Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh. Romans 13, about getting serious about fighting sin. Make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Since the night is far gone and the day is at hand, therefore put aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light by making no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. What is it for you that makes worldliness natural and easy? Answer that question. What is it for you that makes worldliness natural and easy? What is it for you that makes distance from Jesus seem normal and natural? Whatever that is, get rid of it. Get rid of it. Whether it's something online, whether it's a relationship, whether it's a, uh, just an obsession either about politics or sports or music or whatever it is, whatever it is. So take in, number two, keep out. Number three, one-on-one. -on -one. By this, I simply mean talk with another believer about how you're growing and how you need to grow. Get accountable, get prayer support, get advice one-on-one. -on -one. Talk with other believers about Christ and his gospel. It is not good for man to be alone. It is also not good for man or woman to pursue holiness alone. We need each other. Every epistle in the New Testament says encourage one another, exhort one another, help one another. You can't do it without this. The ABFs, Adult Bible Fellowships, are supposed to foster these kinds of relationships. ABFs are filled with Bible teaching and we want them to be filled with Bible teaching, but that's not the sole end of ABFs. The, the fellowship part of it is this, these kinds of relationships where we help each other obey the teaching we've received. So one-on-one, -on -one, number four, one with many. One with many. What, by that, what I mean? I mean, never miss church. Attend corporate worship every week. The epistle to the Hebrews says, uh, this is like a, reading into someone's behavior, and I know we, we can't really see into someone's heart, but the inerrant word of God says in the Bissell of Hebrews, it says this, people who drift away from church always do so because they're being hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And if they wouldn't drift away from church, it wouldn't be so easy for them to be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. So not only one with one, but one with many. Be here to sing, be here to give, be here to hear the preaching of the word. Number five, someone else. By that, I simply mean serve somebody else. Serve somebody else. 
I do know that in my own life, when at times when I have been struggling with my own junk, many times, for me, the way out of my struggle was not to go to another seminar about my junk. The way out of my struggle was to serve somebody else, to get my eyes off myself and to serve somebody else. And there are so many opportunities to serve, so many opportunities to serve here. Always opportunities in the children's ministry, always opportunities in the music ministry. That doesn't just mean that you have to play music. We, people can help with the screens, help with uh, my flight not to get canceled so I can preach. Well, lots of different ways that you can serve around here. The valet ministry to park cars, so many ways to serve. And it really is true that when you serve somebody else, it really helps you out of your, your, your own sort of getting locked up in, in self-obsession and analysis paralysis. Uh, number six. What does it say for number six? <laughs> Money? Good, money, yeah, number six, money. <laughs> Maybe you could serve by helping me to make my notes correct also. Uh, so number six is money. By that I mean give money to the church. Give money to the cause of Christian missions. Okay, wait a minute. This sermon is about how I can change out of sinful habits and become a holy person. Why are you telling me I have to give more money to the church? I am saying that because the Bible says that the, the only way to change in a God-honoring way is to put off and what? Put on. It's not just that you crumble sin and put it in the garbage where that sin was. There has to be something beautiful, something good, something noble, something holy in its place, in its place. And I do know this, that the Lord Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. See, he didn't just say it the flat human way, where your heart is, that's where you'll put your treasure. That's kind of the flat way we would say it. No, Jesus' psychology is way better than that, way more advanced than that. He says, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. So I'm saying, if you want to pursue God's holiness more in your life, why don't you invest your treasure in the pursuit of God's holiness? Find a missionary to support. Find a, a way to give in the offering to a specific cause or what, whatever it might be. And that'll help you more than you think it will. And number seven is music. Listen to and sing good Christian songs. The Bible says in two places, well, more than two places, it says it in Galatians and Colossians and Ephesians. But specifically in Colossians and Ephesians, it, it says that when you're filled with the Spirit is when you can successfully resist sin. And both Colossians and Ephesians indicate that the primary sign of being filled with the Spirit is that you now sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We overlook that too much. I, I really don't care if you don't feel like you're a musical person or not. The Bible says that when you're filled with the Spirit, you will sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. This, is, this has the dual benefit of being the easiest and the most beautiful way to fill your mind with God's word. It's easy. Who can't learn a song? I, I still remember all the ingredients of a Big Mac, even though I don't want to. Why? Because it was in a song. It's the easiest way to remember things, and it's the most beautiful way to remember things. And um, we, for those of you that use it, we, on all the different, um, what do you call it, where you, put music on your phone, we put our, our whole playlist of all the songs that we do together on all the major services. That, that you, can, you can get them, and you can listen to them, and, and so you find your mind being renewed. How else are you going to fix your hope completely on the grace to be revealed unless you sing about it? Those are seven quick strategies. Let me give you one last phrase from the text, and you've got to leave with this phrase in mind. And the phrase is from verse 13. Set your hope fully on the grace that'll be brought to you. This is, this, this is, this is the, the, the gospel 
genius, the gospel essence, the, the very core of the core of the core of what we're talking about. 1 Peter 1, verses 13 through 16 is about this. You need to change, you have been changed, and you can change. It's all about changing your behavior, your conduct, your, your behavior, conforming to what God wants you to do. It is all about the way you behave. And it's all because of God's grace. God's grace. The Christian life is not about conduct we achieve. The Christian life is about the glorious accomplishment and achievement that our Christ has done for us. And now by his grace, we walk in that. We relish in that. We sing about that. We obey that. The reason why you've got to remember that is because you're going to walk out of here and you're going to try to change. And, and, and you, you might do a little better, but for a little while, you might do a little worse. And the only way not to throw in the towel, the only way to get rid of these doubts, well, I tried to change and I didn't, so God must be done with me. The only way to get rid of that is to forever abdicate my own unaided righteousness and to forever lose myself in the righteousness of the Son of God that I wear like a robe, a gracious robe that my father gave me and a ring that he put on my hand that I didn't deserve because I wasted it all on the harlots and the pigs, but God graciously gave me the robe and the ring of Christ's righteousness divine. Amen. That's God's grace. When we look to Christ for that kind of grace, it becomes true that you can change. Let's pray. Bow for prayer. I just give you a moment to pray. To, um, to thank the Lord for his word. Maybe to confess to the Lord some sin, some failing. to thank the Lord for the covering of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> our Father in heaven, our faithful, almighty shepherd, Hear your little lambs as they pray to you. Hearing forgive. Hearing receive. Hearing empower. Lead us beside still waters. Lead us to the grasses that will nourish us in your word. That we might follow you more fully into your love and into the liberty that belongs to the, to the children of God. This we pray that Jesus might be glorified in the life of his church. Amen.